In our series, we have uh, been looking at the secrets of an abundant life. Jesus says, I have come to give life and life more abundantly. That was part of the purpose in Jesus' coming. So he wants that for us. And we've talked about the fact that this is what Jesus offers, and he wants that our joy would be full. And so these joy, blessedness, assurance, and peace, these are some of the benefits that we've looked at throughout this series of lessons and thinking about our beginning with the idea of our bearing fruit, that we might glorify God. And in bearing much fruit, we, we are able to glorify Him even more so. John 15, verse 8. And the secret of bearing fruit is abiding. We spent time looking at those first 10 verses, in particular verse 5. Uh, if we do not abide in the vine, the true vine which is in Christ, as His branches, then we can do nothing. And so we are reminded of that as well. The secret of abiding is our obedience to God, our obeying. John 15 and verse 10, and the secret of obeying is loving. So the last two weeks we looked at these, these four lessons in particular, and we'll finish up this morning. And so as we think about the secret of love, and we talked about, reminded you about the song, uh, the gospel in one word is love. We're reminded of that, and Brother Steve and I went and, and told him, and said, I'm not trying to necessarily piggyback on top of your lessons, but it seems like when both of us are preaching, and we haven't talked about the lessons that, we're, he, that he was teaching or the lessons that I was preaching, uh, but some of these lessons have kind of overlapped a little bit, uh, which I think is a good thing. And so sometimes if you have two preachers uh, telling you something and they're not getting together on this, Maybe something to pay attention to. I'm just saying. So anyway, uh, the gospel in one word is love. But what is the secret of loving? What is it going to take for us to truly love as we should? For us to love God as we should? The secret of loving is knowing. You see, if I know nothing of God's love for me... And what good will it do me? I have to know about it. I have to be told about it. That's why we talk about the necessity of preaching the gospel, teaching others, telling others that, that good old story of Jesus Christ going to the cross, going to Calvary, die for us. The gospel, the good news, the good news story has to be taught. We have to know something about it. In fact, in comparison, not just being born into a religious group, as were the Jews, but when the prophet Jeremiah, directed by the inspiration of God, was talking about a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, he would talk about the fact that there was going to be a new covenant. And in that new covenant, all would be taught about Jesus. And Jesus himself repeated that. He says, look, when you understand that this new covenant that has come, that He was in fact dying, shedding His blood to bring about, He would bring about this new covenant. And in so doing, He says, all would be taught. It's a, it's a religion of knowledge. It's about an understanding. It's about knowing. And so the secret of loving is knowing. We understand this in human relationships. A husband and wife relationship is based upon knowledge. It's based upon understanding. And we, we understand that in that relationship. And we have, I think, a, an understanding, at least if you are a husband or a wife, then you have this uh, well at hand. You understand that, that there is a knowledge and that it's based on that knowledge. When a couple, young couple decide that they're going to get married and they go through their premarital counseling and they're talking and they're being told, here's some things that you're going to need to know about marriage. And also in that premarital counseling, you start, as a counselor, you start trying to get them to know one another better. Know some things about one another. What are your expectations? What is it that you like? What is it that you want in a relationship? And getting those things out in the open so that there is a knowledge of those things. But no matter what you can do as a counselor, premarital counselor especially, 
It, you look at this couple who gets married and on their wedding day, all is beautiful. Everything looks amazing. And then you find them 10 years later and you ask them the question, do you love your spouse the way that you did even before you got married, when you first met, when you first started dating, when you went through the premarital counseling, when you went through on your wedding day and you said, I do, do you love them as much as you did then? Or do you love them more? Well, you love them more. Why? Well, because I know them better. (laughs) We know each other. And we have strengths and weaknesses and we have our, our, our frailties and we have things that we have in common and things that we find out that we were not quite on the same page about. But we have a knowledge of one another and we grow 20 years, 30 years. Ask someone who's been married 50 or 60 years how their love has grown through the years. Why did it grow? Well, because we know one another. So much so that we finish each other's sentences, Right? We know one another. When we we get up in the morning, I I know exactly what it is that Cindy's looking for. She's looking for a pot of coffee. I know that about her. I tried to make make sure that she had that. She's home, not feeling well, so I can talk about her a little bit this morning. But uh, but anyway, so she was looking for the pot of coffee, right? I I know those things about her. Now, we can talk about how, obviously, that grows. All those might be surface things, but but that relationship grows, and it grows based on knowledge. In fact, I believe that's why the Apostle Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, when he's talking about the wife and her role there and, and, and thinking about winning over her husband. But then he says to the husbands, you dwell with her according to... The New King James says understanding. Literally the word is gnosis or knowledge. Having a knowledge of her. And so there's an expectation. The secret of loving is knowledge. It is about knowing. And this truth is demonstrated then in human relationships. We understand this in strong friendships as well. That that, that knowledge, that knowing one another, growing up alongside of someone, there is a relationship that is, that is tight between those individuals who have grown up together. They know one another. They've, they've been through thick and thin, so to speak, with one another. And, and so they are, they are tight. They are close. Those strong friendships. Why? Because they're based on knowing each other that well. And brethren who love one another are, are those who have made the effort to know one another. They've spent time with one another. And in fact, we're commanded to love one another uh, in, that, in that way. And in so doing, the world knows to whom we belong. John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Even so do ye, he says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so that relationship, that's important. And we understand that in human relationships. And so it is with God. The very same way. That the more that we come to know God, the more that we know Jesus, the more we will love them. The more that we will want to spend time with them. The more that we will want to have and enjoy that fellowship. And we know that we are blessed in so doing, as we have already looked in some other lessons already. And especially when we grow in our understanding of their love for us, what they have done for us, right? In Ephesians chapter 1, we'll get to these other verses in a moment, but in Ephesians chapter 1, you begin to see the plan. Because it it spells out for us exactly what God the Father has done, and it spells out for us exactly what Christ the Son has done, It even tells us what the Holy Spirit has done in revealing those things. And so you have Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 and that's about the Godhead at work to save us from our sins. Telling us about that love that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And these are two verses you should put together. Outside, in the, outside these verses, John 13, 16, you should put 1 John 
316 out beside it as well for this very reminder. By this we know love. This is how we understand love. This is how we know love because He laid down His life for us, we're told. And we also should lay down our lives for the brethren. And so this, this obviously has a, a chain reaction, so to speak. God first loved us, we find out. He showed His love and we know Love. This is how we understand love. This is, this, is how it, this is how it all ranks, if you will. The very greatest sacrifice given was given by God, so loving mankind that He gave His only begotten Son. Why? So that you could live. So that I could live. And, and by that very act of love, then we know something about it. We're able to measure then what love looks like. We can see God is love and we can see the very picture of love. We begin to understand something about love, that love typically has a sacrificial element to it. That's especially in the word agape, love. It's a sacrificial love for the benefit of someone else for the betterment of someone else, for life and life eternal and an abundant life for me and you. That sacrifice then was made. And only those who have come to know God have learned to love both man and God. You see, the world struggles with this. We, all you have to do is turn on the news, right? Right? All you have to do is turn on the TV, listen to the radio, turn on Sirius XM, and and turn on your favorite news station, whatever it is. And all you have to do is listen to the news for just a moment, and you'll find out just how much everyone hates everyone else. Right? But what do you find? In God, you find love. In His people, you find love. 1 John chapter 4 becomes very clear because you cannot say that you love your brother and you hate God or that you love God and yet you hate your brother. It doesn't work that way. You have to love your brother. Why? Again, because God first loved you. And this is what you learned about love. And so those who have come to know God, those who have a knowledge of God, for God is love. Right? Verse 8, 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, then it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That's the very point. But there has to be a knowledge, a knowing. And so a place to start is a knowledge of God. And so knowing God, this is the first major step, if you will, in the process of living that abundant life, enjoying those blessings that are in God. And by knowing God, we come to love Him. By loving Him, we will obey Him. And by obeying Him, we will abide in Him. By abiding in Him, we will bear fruit. And by bearing fruit, we will experience the joys of that abundant life. And we will glorify our Father who is in heaven by bearing much fruit. John 15 and verse 8. This is where it begins, with a knowledge of God. And you've probably figured out then what we've actually been doing is kind of walking backwards through these concepts and seeing where it all began. It began with God first loving us, sending His only begotten Son to die for us. And knowing that starts this chain reaction, right? And before we conclude this service, there's one last question. How can we come to know God in such a way so as to produce this chain reaction that leads to this abundant life? And that we find the key to knowing God is through communication. You see, it is, this is, this is where it begins. This is, this is true in our human relationships. We've, ex- we've talked about this already. We understand this. There has to be communication for relationships to grow. 
for a relationship between any individual to grow, there has to be some type of communication. If there's not communication, that relationship is doomed. It's not going to, it's not going to flourish, certainly, and it's going to fail. There has to be communication. And that's why there has to be communication even in the Lord's church, from the eldership to the pew, from the preacher and elders. One for, they're working together for that relationship to be good. There, there's communication. There is an expectation that they have communicated to me. I have expectations and, and, and want to help to see the, the church flourish. And so I express those things and communicate them back to the elders as well. And we work together with the deacons as well and with every member. That has to take place. There has to be a relationship. There has to be a growing. And that's why I spend so much time talking about a family because a strong family unit communicates to one another. They talk about things. Sometimes whether they want to or not. <laughs> they talk about things. It's said that the average female speaks 30,000 words in a day. And the average male, somewhere between 15 to 20. You can do the math on that. It's not the same. A female speaks more words in a day. She doesn't get all those words out during the day. And so husbands, when you get home, your wife wants to talk. She still has words. She's still trying to meet her quota to get to that certain number, right? I'm, I'm sure. She's got, she wants to talk, right? And the husband sometimes feels that he's all talked out. But you still got to communicate for it to work. You've got to work on those things. There has to be communication or else the relationship is doomed. And so it is then with our God as well. Communication is a two-way street. It is with God as well. He speaks to us through His Word. 2 Peter 1 verse 21. We'll look at these verses in a moment. John 16 verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, we're going to be reminded of, of what Paul has written and how to look at that, how to view that. And so God has communicated to mankind. We're reminded of this in Hebrews chapter 1. At various times and various ways, God has spoken unto us, or spoken unto the fathers by the prophets, and hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. He has communicated. And in those couple of verses, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, he's told us exactly how he's done that. In various ways, at various times, he's spoken in different ways, now speaks to us through his son. And so let's notice how he has done just that through his word. In 2 Peter 1, verse 21, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. A picture of inspiration. And this is why there's no private interpretation of, of Scripture. You have the verse before this, verse 20, reminds us of that. And then immediately continues in that sentence, For prophecy never came by the will of man. How did it come? It came by the will of God. And He used man, He inspired man, the Holy Spirit did, to speak on behalf of God. Then we have other verses that remind us of the same. In John 16, Jesus is meeting with His apostles. And he's speaking directly to them. He says, I have many things still to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He's not going to speak on His own authority. He's not going to speak, in other words, of Himself. Whatever He hears, that will He speak, and He will teach you and tell you things to come. He's going to guide the apostles into all truth. And that's not the first time in that conversation that he's told them this. He's explained that it would be the Comforter. What he's calling here, who he's calling here, the Spirit of Truth. In, verses, in chapter 16, verse 13. But in chapter 15 and chapter 14, verse 26, in both of those chapters, he refers to the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. That he would give them remembrance. That he would help them. Give them the words to say. God communicating to mankind. 
And then Paul says, he says, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you, that they are the commandments of the Lord. Paul says, this is not my teaching. This is not my words. This is the Lord's commandments. And those are the things that I'm writing to you. And so if anyone thinks himself to be spiritual, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet, if anyone would call himself religious, if anyone who is religious-minded, then they will acknowledge these things. God has commanded His will to mankind. And He's done so, revealed by the Spirit, to these writers, to the apostles, those very things from the mind of God, using the vocabulary of these men. But these are the words of God. He has communicated to mankind. And it's through that communication then that we begin to realize that we have the opportunity to have a relationship. God has communicated. We think about passages like Psalm 19, for, for instance. It, it, it talks about the creation in those first couple verses of that psalm. And, and that's, that's how we know there is a God. Look at the creation. A man didn't do that. No big boom did that. God did that. An all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God did that. In verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I know nothing about the fact that God loves me until I begin to read His Word. And we're communicating. At least now He's communicating to me through His Word. It's not mysterious, it's not miraculous in that sense. I open His Word, I begin to read, I study, and I begin to take those things in. Then I realize that in a relationship, it's two-way. I need to say some things. I too have a vocabulary. I'm going to, to meet my quota for the day. Part of my quota for the day, I want, I want to tell God some things. I, I've learned some things that God has done for me. I want to say some things. I want to let God know how much I love Him. I want to let God know that I, I can't believe like the psalmist did. You're mindful of me? You were thinking about me? Why were you thinking about me? And I read His Word and I find out that He wants to save me. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of Him. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. He doesn't want me to die in sin. I can have a relationship with Him. I find out exactly what He wants me to do. And because I I love Jesus, I'm going to do what He has commanded. I'm going to obey the gospel. I'm going to put on Christ in baptism because I am so very sorry because I have sinned against God. And Paul says the same thing. I didn't know about sin until I read the law. That's how I became aware of this. I had a knowledge of it. I realized I've done wrong. I need to change. I need to do better. And this is how to do better. In 2 Timothy 3, the Word of God is inspired... Literally, God breathed for what purpose? To teach me, to instruct me, to correct me, to show me the way of righteousness so that I could be perfect in God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so it's this communication. And it is a two-way street. I read His Word and I spend time in prayer. Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing but in everything. You catch that? In everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In this relationship, I find out that that even in my praying unto God, because I'm in this relationship now, I'm a child of His, 
I'm able to speak to, to the Father directly through the Son. I can tell Him exactly what I'm thinking. I, I can express things to Him that are, that are making me so stressed out, so anxious every day. I can express those to Him. And you know what He's going to do? He's going to help guard my heart. He's going to guard me. He's going to protect me. He's going to help me. Does that sound like a relationship that you want? It's one that we, we always will long for, right? This kind of relationship. In 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing in everything. There it is again. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is what He wants. He wants for us to, to read and study His Word. He wants us to express our hearts in praise and thanksgiving to Him. And He will care for us. He'll protect us. He'll guard us. And as simple as it may sound, reading the Bible and praying to God can be that that catalyst, if you will, that starts that chain reaction, leading one to be able to experience then that abundant life that we've been talking about. So let's notice as we begin to close the, the value of God's Word. It's described by the psalmist here. In Psalm 1, beginning of verse 1, Blessed is the man. There's a beatitude for you right here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight... What is it? What is it that he likes? What is it that, he, that he's focused on? What is it that he spends his time doing? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. How has he benefited? He shall be like a tree one that's planted right beside the rivers of water. And what does it do? What does it accomplish? It brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What a beautiful passage. But notice and do not miss the correlation between what we've been talking about, the idea of bearing fruit, and abiding in the true vine, which is Christ, abiding in Him as He does in the Father. For without me, He says, you can do nothing. We have to have a knowledge of that. And so the psalmist says, this blessed man, you find out the things that he's, he's against, right? He's not going to hang out with the ungodly or the scornful or sinners. That's not where he's spending his time. That's not what he's about. That's not what he's doing. He's changed his life. He has a different relationship. And this new relationship, he delights in God's Word. And day and night he spends in it. Growing and growing and growing in what? In a knowledge. And what does it do for him? It benefits him. And that whatever he does, he shall prosper. He's going to bear fruit in His season. And in bearing fruit, my Father is glorified. Jesus says again, John 15 and verse 8. But we also notice the value of prayer in receiving those blessings from God. It was taught in the model prayer. I know Brother Steve taught on this as well this past Wednesday night. This one I actually knew about, but it was part of the lesson. I couldn't miss it. The value of prayer is seen in the model, the example that Jesus gave to us. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. And in the old King James, you find those ETH endings. About he that asketh, and he that seeketh, and he that knocketh. In other words, the one who continues to do so. He continues to ask. He continues to seek. He continues to knock. That sounds like he's abiding, doesn't it? That sounds like he's spending time thinking about God, spending time in this relationship on this two-way street where we're reading and studying God's Word, and now we're asking. Now we're seeking. Now we're knocking. 
And what does God do for us? Everyone who asks receives, and he who asks, or seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. What man is there among you, he says, if a son asked for bread, would give him a stone, or if he asked for fish, would give him a serpent? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Think about this for a moment. The value of the relationship that we have with God, both His Word, by which we benefit and bear fruit, and prayer, by which we benefit and are blessed in so many ways, in ways that He, he answers. What is best for me, and sometimes I don't know, but I'm still asking, and I'm still seeking, and I'm still knocking, and His answer is always what is best for me. And even if it's no, and even if it's wait, and even if it's not this, but I've got something better for you, I have to trust Him. And the reason that I can trust Him is I have that relationship with Him, a relationship that is built on knowledge, knowing that He loves me. So as we experience those things, this is, this is what Paul would pray for. In Ephesians chapter 3, you go back and read Paul's prayer. We don't have time to cover it this morning. Verses 14 through 21, it, it ends in talking about uh, uh, he, that he will answer uh, and that he will give above all that we ask or think. But he's saying, my prayer for you is that you would know the love of God. And my prayer for you is that by doing so, you would be strengthened. Strengthened in the inner man. That love, that strength, that's what we gain. Those are benefits in this relationship. And experiencing those things, these blessings, help us to know God even that much better. The psalmist again, he says, I love the Lord. Watch this. Because he's heard my voice, he's heard my supplications. In other words, he's heard me praying. He's heard me praying. Because he's inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him for as long as I live. A relationship that is just growing stronger and stronger together. Because of a knowledge. And because of those things that we experience, those blessings that we experience in Him. What we find then is that this abundant life is almost self-perpetuating. It's, it's a cycle that keeps repeating. And I, I keep reading and studying and I keep praying and, and, and asking and, and seeking and, and knocking and I keep reading and, and, and I continue to grow. And I find that, that often my faith is tested and yet some way God has been there helping me walk every step of the way and I trust Him that much more. A relationship that's coming tighter and closer and stronger. That's what we're talking about. I love the Lord. Why? Because He has heard my voice. He has heard my supplications. He has heard my cries. That's the idea. And if we're willing to know Him by giving our minds to Him as we read His Word and pray, then we will love God by giving Him our hearts and by loving Him, we will obey Him, following His commands. And obeying Him, we will abide in Him and benefit from His strength, not just ours. And benefiting in that strength, we will bear fruit, and even much fruit, and glorify the Father in heaven.
In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Watch what Jeremiah wrote. That he understands and knows me, that I am Jehovah, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness throughout the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. To know God is to love Him. To love God is to obey Him. To obey Him is to abide in Him. To abide in Him is to bear fruit for Him. And to bear fruit is to experience that abundant life that the true vine has for His branches. What about us? As we commit these lessons to our lives, and I have to commend Brother Riley for an excellent quarter on Sunday morning, those lessons conforming to the image of Christ. They have reminded us over and over, challenged us in many ways to do better, to even step out of our comfort zone and to step out of our complacency sometimes and do those things that would be pleasing to Him. As the prophet Jeremiah reminds us, These things I delight in, says the Lord. This morning you may have a need. It it may be one that is pressing concerning your salvation. As a child of God, you may need to repent of something that's in your life, something amiss. Ask for forgiveness. Let us pray for you and encourage you every way that we can. And maybe this morning there's someone here who needs to obey the gospel. Maybe someone who's been putting it off. Someone who knows that Jesus has died for them. God sent His only begotten Son and would acknowledge that and confess that and turn away from the practice of sin and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Maybe you're one this morning who's just in need, one who would like for us to pray as a family. We're here to do that. We're here to help in any way that we can. And so if you have a need, come to the front while we stand, while we sing.